In this lesson, we will be discussing direct proofs. In our previous lectures, we talked about propositions, open sentences, and quantifiers. That is, we discussed the language of mathematics. In this lesson, we are going to put our knowledge to use in proving that statements are true. What do we mean by a proof? A proof is a process by which a mathematical statement is shown to be true. Each step of the process follows logically from axioms, stated assumptions, or previously established results until the desired mathematical result is reached. Let us start with the definition of a theorem. A theorem is a mathematical statement that is true and its truth is demonstrated via a proof. A lemma is usually a minor result that we prove in order to use it later to prove a bigger result. We use lemmas as a way of breaking up large proofs into smaller, more understandable pieces. So for example, you can see something like you have lemma 1 and then you have lemma 2 and then theorem. This is the main result. If you do not use lemmas, what will happen is that the proof of this theorem will be very, very long. But if you break it into smaller pieces, that is why you use lemmas. The proof of the theorem will not be that long. What about a corollary? A corollary is, again, usually a minor result that follows immediately from another result we have proved. So you can see something like this. Let's say you have a theorem, then you have a proof here, and then you will see corollary. And the proof of the corollary usually is just one or two sentences because, as I have mentioned here, the result follows immediately from the theorem. Of course, a definition states the meaning of a word or word group. Here are the definitions that we will be using for our proofs in this lecture. First, an integer n is called even if n is equal to 2 times an integer m. It is called odd if we can write it as 2 times an integer plus 1. So take note that again this means even means you can be written as a product of 2 and an integer. Whereas for odd you can be written as 2 times an integer plus 1. Notice the precision in these definitions. What if we could have said an integer n is called even if n is equal to 2m? What is wrong with this? In this case, you did not define what m is. So that is ambiguous. What is m? Or for example here, n is equal to 2m for some number m. You don't really quantify what kind of number is m. So this one is not specific. If we use this definition here, you can say that all integers are even because you can say 7 is equal to 2 times 3.5 if you are using this one. However, the definition says that this number here must be an integer. Next, let us have the definition of divisibility. Suppose that we have two integers, n and d. We say that d divides n and we express it as this d divides n if the integer n can be written as d times an integer m. We say that d is a divisor or a factor of n and that n is a multiple of d. If it happens that d is strictly smaller than n, we say that d is called a proper divisor of n. If d does not divide n, we use this notation. d does not divide n. So, for example, 8 divides 40 because 40 is equal to 8 times 5. And 5 is an integer. Take note that this notation is not the rational number 8 over 40 nor 40 over 8. This is just a notation in saying that 8 divides 40. 40. Also, you cannot say 8 divides 40 equals 5. This is wrong. In this lesson, we are going to study proofs of this form.
P, then Q. The first and most important proof method is the direct proof of the implication. Since this is false, when the premise is true and the conclusion is false, we will show that an implication is true by showing that this case cannot happen. And that is, it suffices to show that if the premise is true, the conclusion must also be true. Recall that we no longer care if the premise is false because if the premise is false, regardless of the truth value of the conclusion Q, the implication will always be true. Hence, a direct proof will have the following form. You assume the premise P, assume that that is true, and then develop a chain of statements that leads you to the conclusion Q is true. Once you have done this, it already means that you have proven that the statement P then Q is true. In writing your proofs, take note of the following. Make sure that you state the hypothesis, if there is any, and then determine the premise and conclusion of the implication you are trying to prove. Once you have determined those, you assume that the premise is true and then develop a chain of statements that leads to the conclusion of your implication. Here is a tip for you. Do not just put a string of symbols. Every step of your proof should express a complete sentence. Here is our first example. Let x be an integer. Prove that if x is odd, then x plus 1 is even. We are going to prove it, but this is just our scratch because this will tell you how the proof will look like. The first step says that you have to state your hypothesis. And what is your hypothesis here? x is an integer. And then what are you proving here? You are proving this implication. If x is odd, then x plus 1 is even. Your premise is x is odd. And your conclusion is x plus 1 is even. The step says that you have to assume that the premise is true. So assume x is odd. And then at the end, you have something there. At the end, you want to arrive at the conclusion that x plus 1 is even. The question is, what will we write here so that from this assumption, from our given, we will achieve the desired result, which is x plus 1 is even. When is an integer even? We want to achieve this one. x plus 1 is equal to 2 times an integer. Let's go back to our given. x is odd, so that means x is equal to 2m plus 1 for some integer m. Take note that I clearly defined what my m is. And we want to achieve x plus 1. So how do we do that? We add 1 to both sides of the equation. We get 2m plus 2 here. But take note, we want to achieve x plus 1 is equal to 2 times an integer. And we can now write this as 2 times m plus 1. Is m plus 1 an integer? Yes, this is an integer because m and 1 are integers. Now, this is just a scratch. This is not yet a final proof because, as you notice, these are not even sentences. I just want you to see how your proof will go from the given until you reach your conclusion. So, here is the formal proof. Let x be an integer. That was our hypothesis. And this is the premise of the implication. Suppose that x is odd. From the definition of odd integers, x is equal to 2m plus 1 for some integer m. Take note that I did not write this in my scratch. And then, adding 1 to both sides of the equation yields x plus 1 is equal to 2m plus 2 equals 2 times m plus 1. Since m is an integer, m plus 1 is also an integer. Hence, we have shown that x plus 1 is a product of 2 and an integer. Therefore, x plus 1 is odd. Here's another tip for you. Use writing techniques such as transitions and word choice to strengthen your proof and guide your audience. So for example, I use transition words, hence meaning to say from here to here. 
and then I have therefore and I also used words to guide my audience so I've I used that here we have shown that x plus 1 is a product of 2 and an integer next example suppose a b and c are integers prove that if a divides b and b divides c then a divides c so let's have the proof. Where should we start? Start with the hypothesis. So suppose a, b, and c are integers. What are we trying to prove here? We are proving this implication. If a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c. Our premise is this one. a divides b and b divides c. And we want to arrive at a divides c. C. So therefore, we assume our premise, assume A divides B and B divides C. Notice that I am not using the notation A divides B and B divides C. So as much as possible, if you can just write out the words better. Let us write our goal here. Our goal at the end is to achieve that a divide c here i use the notation because this is just sort of scratch i just want you to see where you want to go keep your eyes on the price all right this is where you want to go a divide c and what does it mean that a divide c always put equivalent statements all right a divide c means that c is equal to a times an integer this is what you want to achieve. C is equal to A times an integer. Let us use our given to achieve this one. A divides B means that B is equal to A times an integer M. So for some integer M. And B divides C means that C is equal to B times, let's call it N, for some integer N. Take note, this is sort of scratch. I will polish this later. What do we want? We want to get that C is equal to A times an integer, but I already have C here. C is equal to B times N, but I want to have A here. What should we do? We just plug in this one. So plugging that in, we have C is equal to AM. That is my B and then N. And that is now a times mn. Is mn an integer? Yes, because both m and n are integers. I will just use words to connect the expressions that I have written here. So how do we proceed? How did we get this one? By definition of divisibility, we can say there are integers m and n such that b is equal to am and then i already said there are integers m and n so i will now delete this b is equal to am and probably i will just put this on this line and c is equal to bn so as you notice i am doing the scratch and the formal proof at the same time and then how did we arrive at this equation here Plugging in B in the second equation above, we get C is equal to A times MN, and we can write this as A times the product MN. So I will just delete this. I will go directly to C equals AMN. For our last step, we have to mention that M and N really are integers. Since M and N are integers, so is M N. Therefore, A divides C. That's the end of our proof. So we use a box like this. And then I will now delete this one. Here's another example. Suppose A, B, and C are integers. Prove that if A divides B and A divides C, then A divides B minus C. So we start by stating our hypothesis. 
Suppose a, b, and c are integers. We are proving this implication. If a divides b and a divides c, then a divides b minus c. We start by assuming our premise. Assume a divides b and a divides c. We want to end up with a divides b minus c. This means that b minus c is equal to a times some integer. So let us go back to our given a divides b and a divides c. That means that b is equal to a times m and c is equal to a times n for some integers m and n. How do we know that those integers exist? By definition again of divisibility. By definition of divisibility, there are integers m and n such that b is equal to a m and c is equal to a m. This is a sentence, so make sure that you end with a period. What's next? We want to get b minus c. I will just write here b minus c. We will just plug it in. a m minus a n. And this is, take note, we want to achieve a times an integer. We can now factor a. So that's m minus n. But again, we have to put sentences here to explain where we got this equation. So using the above equations, we get b minus c is equal to this one. And then again, since m and n are integers, so is m minus n. Hence, a divides b minus c. That's the end of the proof. Next example, show that if x and y are both odd integers, then their sum is even. Take note that we do not have any hypothesis here. We just want to prove this implication. The premise is that x and y are both odd integers and that the conclusion is their sum is even. But this means that x plus y, because we're talking about x and y here, x plus y is even. So we can write this as if x and y are both odd integers, then x plus y is even. So to proceed with our proof, again, we start with our premise. Assume x and y are both odd integers. We want to end up with their sum is even. x plus y is even. Always write an equivalent statement for this. And the definition is that x plus y can be written as 2 times an integer. This is where you want to go. So let's go back to our given. So again, by definition of odd integers or odd numbers, we can find integers m and n such that x is equal to 2m plus 1 and y is equal to 2n plus 1. Next, we will just add this too. Adding x and y yields x plus y is equal to 2m plus 1 plus 2n plus 1. And this is 2m plus 2n plus 2n. Take note that we want to achieve 2 times an integer. This is 2 times m plus n plus 1. When you are writing your proof, always know your audience. So here, I will no longer say that since m and n are integers, so is m plus n plus 1. I can now start assuming from here that my readers are students like you who can already see the connection that m plus n plus 1 is an integer. So I can now say, therefore, x plus y is even. As an exercise... Try to do this. Show that the product of any two odd integers is odd. Take note that this is an example wherein it is not written in the if-then format. However, you have to write it first as an implication. And what is that implication? If x and y 
are odd, then xy is also odd. So therefore, you start with assuming that x and y are odd and then show that xy is odd. Next example, suppose that we have three odd integers. We want to show that x times y plus z is even. Take note that you can proceed just like what we did before, wherein you write x as 2m plus 1, this is 2n plus 1, and then let's say this is 2l plus 1 for some integers m, n, and l. However, I have to stay conscious of previously shown results. If something has already been proven, there is no need to prove it again. You can expedite the process by citing the results. What do I mean by that? Take note here that y and z are odd integers. What can we say about the sum of odd integers? We have already seen an example for that the sum, this is saying that the sum of odd integers is an even integer. So therefore, we can use this result. So let us start with the proof. I will still start with my premise. Suppose x, y, and z are odd integers, then I want to end up with x times y plus z is even. I will now make use of example 4. So by example 4, y plus z is even. It suffices to show that the product of an odd integer, this is odd, and this is even, I want to show that the product of an odd and an even integer is again even. So I will write that here. So take note that I am guiding the reader where I want to go. It suffices to show that the product of an odd and even integer is even. So how do I prove this? I have to introduce another set of variables. I can no longer use x, y, and z. Take note that when you are writing your proofs, do not use the same variables because you have already defined your variables here. They are already fixed. x, y, and z are already fixed odd integers. So I will start with let say r and s be odd and even integers respectively. When you say respectively, this means r is odd, s is even. Our new goal is to show that the product rs is even. So I will put that as an exercise. And then assuming that you have already shown that, I will now proceed with my proof. I have just shown that the product of an odd and even integer is even. So I will now say here that since x is odd and y plus z is even, then their product x times y plus z is even. And you have now reached your goal. That concludes your proof. To get a sense of how a proof of an implication should proceed, it is sometimes useful to work backward from what is to be proved. Decide what statement could be used to prove it, and then continue until you reach a hypothesis or the premise or a fact which is known to be true. Then after doing this preliminary work, you can now construct a proof forward. When I say forward, that is starting from the premise, you go to your conclusion. This is the forward approach, whereas for the backward approach, you are starting with your conclusion and then this is your premise. You go your way back until you reach your premise. But then after doing this, this is just a preliminary work, you construct a proof forward. Take note that this doesn't mean that you are assuming that the conclusion is true. No, you are still starting with the premise. You are assuming that the premise is true and then show that your conclusion is true as well. Let me illustrate that in this example. So suppose that A and B are positive real numbers. We want to prove that if A is less than b, then b squared minus a squared is greater than zero. So I will have here the scratch. So here we are starting with 
the premise a is less than b, we want to achieve b squared minus a squared is greater than 0. Okay, I will work my way backwards. b squared minus a squared is greater than 0. This is the same as b minus a, b plus a greater than 0. When it's a product of two numbers positive, it's either that both of them are positive or both of them are negative. However, since A and B are positive, we have that this is positive and therefore B minus A should be positive as well. So we have here that B minus A is positive and where will you get this from the premise that A is less than B. So therefore, we will now work our way forward. First, let us start with our hypothesis. Let A and B be positive real numbers. And we are assuming that A is less than B. Since A is less than B, then B minus A is positive. Since A and B are positive, B plus A is also positive. Hence, we have this part. B minus A times B plus A is positive. We got that from the two previous statements. B minus A is positive. B plus A is positive. Then you can say, therefore, B squared minus A squared is greater than zero. This is the proof. Sometimes it is helpful to work both ways. Backward from the conclusion, you go up. And then forward from your premise until you reach a common statement from each direction. Let me illustrate that in this example. So here we are starting with x squared is less than or equal to 1. We want to end up with x squared minus 7x greater than negative 10. I will go backwards. So I have x squared minus 7x plus 10 greater than 0. And then I'll factor this. x minus 5, x minus 2 greater than 0. So I'm done. Then what I will do is start from here, go forward. x squared is less than or equal to 1 means x squared minus 1 is less than or equal to 0. When we solve this inequality, we get x is between negative 1 and 1. I want to achieve this, x minus 5 and x minus 2. If x is between negative 1 and 1, my x minus 5 will be between, this is negative 6, 1 minus 5, so that's negative 4. And my x minus 2 is between negative 3 and negative 1. In both of these cases, x minus 5 and x minus 2 are both negative. And we can now achieve this one. Since they are both negative, x minus 5 times x minus 2 is positive and so on. So take note that this is just scratch. This is not yet the formal proof. Here is now our formal proof. Note that this sense did not clearly define what x is. So there should be let x be a real number here. That is a hidden hypothesis because make sure that you always define what your variables are. Let x be an, a real number and then suppose our premise x squared less than or equal to 1. From here we get that x is between negative 1 and 1. You can say solving this inequality yields x is between negative 1 and 1. Thus, x minus 5 is between is that negative 6 and 4. x minus 2 is between negative 3 and 
negative 1. In both of these, x minus 5 and x minus 2 are negative. Thus, the product x minus 5, x minus 2 is positive. By using algebraic manipulation, get the desired result x squared minus 7x is greater than negative 10. Again, I am taking note of my audience here. I no longer showed these parts here. I can already assume that my readers can connect the dots. How to go from here to here. That concludes your proof.